a very important title and a very important subject. It's called Islamicism, Genocidal Antisemitism, and the Place of the Other. Uh, Dr. Kadar is a lecturer at the Department of Arabic, uh, at the Department of Arabic at the at the Begin Sadat Center for Strategic Studies at Bar Ilan University. He's held the position of lecturer at Bar Ilan for the past 12 years in the Departments of Arabic and Middle Eastern Studies. He's a member of various uh, research groups, including the Begin Sadat Center for Strategic Studies. He's dealing with issues, I'm part of a research group dealing with the uh, entitled Facing Radical Islam at Herzliya's IDC Center, and looking at Muslim minorities in Western countries at the Jerusalem Institute for Israel Studies at Hebrew University. Dr. Kadar has a PhD from bar Ilan University, and his research dealt, in, for his doctorate, dealt with uh, the political language in the Syrian, of the Syrian press. He studied as a lieutenant, he studied, he was a lieutenant colonel in the Israeli Defense Forces for 25 years, and he's the author of such important books as uh, entitled Clash of Values, Gender and Family Issues as Sources of Tension Between Islam and the West, which was published in 2007. <coughs> Our Children Are in Danger, uh, Education as Viewed by the Islamic Movement in Israel, and many other uh, publications, academic publications, and uh, journalist uh, media uh, publications. And I would just like to say, you know, as Professor Katz uh, informed me today, he was we were talking about the issues in Venezuela, what's happening to the Jewish community as we speak. Apparently, members of the community are being singled out. And what's, for me, I guess as a scholar, fascinating but certainly troubling, is the relationship between, say, the radical left in the West and the radical Islam from the East. And Venezuela is a case in which Iran and uh, Chavez, apparent the leftists, have these sort of uh, close connections with common enemies. And I think I was just in Israel at the, um, the Center for Iranian Studies at uh, Tel Aviv University, and I also spent the day at the IDC, the Herzliya Conference. And really, this issue of today's lecture of uh, Islamicism and genocidal antisemitism is so important that I think Israel is becoming increasingly, in a sense, really on the front line of an issue that even in places like Yale University and uh, the lecture last night, that scholars and intellectuals and students really need to become uh, aware of the, not only the, the, the threat of radical Islam and genocidal anti-Semitism and the threat to Israel, but the threat to women, to people with different gender identities, the gay, gay community, and, and especially Muslims who have different views on the radical Islamists, and the threat that this movement poses to them, and sort of the acquiescence and the blindness that still, uh, at this point, with the Iranian uh, nuclear program, the launching of their satellite yesterday, that we seem to be half asleep. So I hope that we'll listen to Dr. Kadar intensely today because the subject is of uh, extraordinary importance. So it's an honor that you're here and, and thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Small. It is uh, a real honor for me uh, to be in such an event and in such an institution like Yale uh, University. Thank you very much for inviting me and giving me the floor for addressing this. Secondly, as you might hear, my English is not original English, it's not uh, native English. So if here and there I miss a word, forgive me. I'll try to find another one. Uh, this is only for the <coughs> But before, before I start dealing with the subject, I would like to have one or two uh, methodological remarks. We Israelis live in, I would say, the crater of the volcano, or the Middle Eastern volcano. <coughs> I myself served in the is an intelligence, not because I'm such an intelligent man. And as you might know, military intelligence might in some times be an oxymoron. <laughs> but mainly because uh, I read Arabic, I speak Arabic, and many of my colleagues in the intelligence, this is what gives them the ticket. Among other things, the mastering of the language means we read, we listen, we see, 
much of what is being published in various stages in the art world. We don't need translations. We sense the things from the way they are phrased. And there are many, many ways how to phrase things, even in Arabic. Unfortunately, too many people in the Western academia, in Western uh, diplomacy, in Western foreign uh, ministries, in Western media, in Western uh, uh, intelligence organizations, very few people master Arabic. Very few people have in uh, have direct access to not to the text, but to the nuances. Very few people understand deeply what is meant by all kinds of covert messages, and there are many. And the situation in Iraq uh, is only the, one of the outcomes of this situation, where people are going forward to a place, to a culture, which they have very little knowledge about, and are trying to create democracy, for example, what we say in Arabic, between night and dawn. It cannot happen. The American dream is shared by all the groups which are here in America, the Afro-Americans, the Chinese, and the Hispanic, and the Jews, and the wasps, and the whatever you know. The one common denominator which combines them is the American dream. As much as I understand the domestic American arena, the Middle East has no dreams. It lives in a reality. This is why the reality imposes itself on the peoples of the Middle East. And dreams can be beyond the Atlantic. I don't know what is the barrier between the knowledge and the American people. And I'm not, without talking about knowledge, I'm talking about other cultures. African culture, East Asian culture, Islamic culture, Arab culture. Still, I don't know whether it was the Atlantic or the Pacific Ocean, maybe the distance, I'm not sure. Something, and just to compare the Brits, and forgive me for making this comparison, whenever during my life, whether in the intelligence or later, British, Many more of them. When they deal with something, they learn the language, they spend time, effort, years on learning languages. And they sit on the same chair, on the same position for decades. In the public service, in the media, and for them it's okay because everyone becomes, looks at veritas, as written on Yale's icon on the list or whatever. Unfortunately, maybe the, the organizational culture in North America, if, some, if somebody sits on the same chair for more than a year and a half, some people would look at him as stuck. So since the minute people sit on one chair, they start looking for the next position. It is in the intelligence, and I know it. It is in the, form of, in the State Department, and it is in many fields. It creates mediocrity. It creates or it prevents people from becoming experts. They are successful because they became very fast ahead of. But the knowledge which they drag behind them is in many cases too shallow uh, to give them the real tools to understand cultures like in the Middle East. And I said it, and I, look, I might sound not politically correct, and I know what I am, but the time which I'm given, which is only five hours to talk, 
we have to say the things. To name a spade. A spade. So, forgive me for being once in a while too clear. But uh, after all, we Israelis, we don't look for uh, round uh, roundabouts. We go for in too many, too many cases. Uh, these, these are the, the two small remarks uh, which I wanted to, to make. And uh, I humbly say, say that Israeli, and I'm not pointing to myself, to my colleagues in the field of uh, Islam, Arab culture, Arab history, uh, I think that we do have what to sell to the world. After all, we are there. We are getting it from all, all the sides, from all around us. Unfortunately, we have to face it once in a while, as we saw them in the last month. And if you go to the, to the subject itself, I would like to start from the last words of the topic, the look to the other, the way the other is perceived <coughs> in the Middle East. Islam, according to its own way of thinking, came to the world not to live side by side with the former traditions, in spite of the fact there is a verse in Quran, lakum dinukum walidi, means you have your religion and I have my religion. Another verse dominates the usual way of thinking, especially in modern times, which is inna din Allah al-Islam, means the religion at Allah's is Islam means the Judaism and Christianity, the two religions which Islam had to confront in its beginning, became invalid since Islam came to the world. Islam in its views, in its view, sees Judaism or Jews as those who betrayed Allah by forging his holy scriptus. <coughs> Therefore they are al mardubu alayhim means those who uh, uh, Allah's wrath rest upon because they betrayed Allah. They were given the gospel but they forged the holy scriptus. This is why Allah is angry at them. And this is said by every Muslim at least five times a day in the prayer at the first chapter of the Quran, whom uh, Jews are al alayhim, those upon whom the wrath of Allah rests, they are descendants of <coughs> swines and apes, they are prophet killers, this is something which came from Christianity and many other uh, epithets which are attributed to Jews. This is, by the way, the way which Muhammad tried to build the Islamic legitimacy, to the, the legitimacy to his new religion by undermining the legitimacy of the former religions. After all, many of the stories which he brought in the Quran are taken from the from the Bible. The story about Noah and the Ark, the, the story about uh, uh, the sons of Israel who are coming out from Egypt, and then the Joseph with, uh, with uh, this woman. Every, many, many stories from the, from the uh, Bible, from the Mishnah, from the Talmud, are in, in a way or another, in a verse or another, in the Quran, in the Hadith, and in Islamic sources. I would even say 70, maybe. 80% of those stories have Jewish background. Another 10, 20% remind us of Christian uh, things. And another 10% are sediments of former uh, idol worshiping religions 
especially the Kaaba, the holy stone, the black stone in Mecca, was an idol for centuries before Islam came to the world. Apparently, Muhammad Islamized it, basing on the idea that if you cannot fight them, Islamize them. So, by undermining the validity of Judaism and Christianity, <coughs> Islam tried to build its own validity in the Judaism. So, this is a basic way. Look, Jews and Christians are tolerated, not, should not be exterminated. And I must uh, admit, the Jewish history in Islamic states was way much better than it was in Christian countries. There was never a crematorium in Islamic states. Muslims, I think, never even think about it. An industrial extermination of Jews was never thought about <coughs> in, in, in Islam. This was not the Torah. They needed the Jews to show maybe the church also used sometimes Jews in order to show what happened to whom, to he who doesn't accept the right gospel. So they, in the world, they needed Jews also to translate <coughs> books and to be the clerks and many other things. Merchants. Jews could live with Christians as Vimis, those who can live under the Islamic umbrella, as long as they accept the Islamic rules, the Islamic uh, mores, and they do not uh, bring any damage to the state or whatever. And they were tolerated in many cases. Okay, we know about events of, of um, uh, Islamization by force in Morocco, al Muahideen. We saw it in, in Iran in some times. Okay. But usually talking, life of Jews in Islamic State was, I would say, normal. As long as they knew their status, as long as they did what they should do, and they did not do what they should not do. But the view to Jews was as a community, not as a nation. A religion, not as a people. And what do I mean by this? The Arab world is today almost 300 million Arabs. But the religions, there are many, or some religions inside the Arab world. There are the Arab Muslims, the Arab Christians, there are Druze, there are Alawis, there are Ahmadis, there are Baha'is, there are Alawis. Yazidis, and Jews. And this is very important. In the way how the Middle East looks at those communities, Jews is another religion which Arabs have. Just like Arab Christians, Arab Alawis, Arab Druze, Arab Muslims, Arab Jews. They don't see the Jewish people as a people, as a religion. Just like there are no Christian people in the Arab world. And this is a very basic point which foreigners find hard to understand. Therefore, since Christians, Arab Christians, Nobody mentions any right of those Christians to have a state. Why should they? There are Copts in Egypt, they are Christians. The Ashuris in, uh, uh, in Iraq, there are other uh, sects of Ashuris in Syria. There are Maronites in Lebanon. Okay? There are many Christian factions or communities all over the Middle East and everyone lives wherever he lives, dwells wherever he dwells, and that's it. Was ever somebody who said that we need a Christian state for Christians? It was. The Crusader state. 
But the cool thing is that we are Christians for, from Europe, which totally have no right to be in the Middle East. After all, they are not Arabs. But even Arab Christians, who would accept to give a piece of land for the Arab Christians to establish a Christian state? What are they, a people? No, they are Arabs. So why the heck they need a state? They can live peacefully wherever they are. Jews are feel the same. Why the heck Arab Jews from Morocco and Arab Jews from Iraq and Arab Jews from Yemen and from Egypt or from Algeria or from Syria and Lebanon, why should they all go to Palestine to make it? A, a what? A Jewish state? But they are not a people. They are only religion. Okay? This is the initial problem in the Arab world to accept Israel as a Jewish state. Because if it's a Jewish, why should it be a state? They can be Jewish whatever they are. Especially if this Jewish state, as illegitimate as it is, brings off all, all, all kinds of Americans, British, Russians, who are all British, Americans, and Russians, happen to be Jews. But what difference does it make? They are Americans, Russians, French, and British. Why should they come to the Arab world? They are not Arabs. They are born in Poland. So they are Polish Jews. Just like Polish Christians. They are Polish. This is the basic way how the Arab world looks at Israel. They don't even understand why Jews or how Jews became a nation to deserve a state. Because in their way of thinking, Jews are community, religion, just like other communities who can live very nicely together wherever they are. So the illegitimacy of the state of Israel starts from here. And to this, that anyway, Judaism lost its uh, validity since Islam came to the world. So not only that they are invalid religion, now they are basing a nation on this invalid religion. How can it work? So it's a problem over a problem of viewing the other from the Arab world, from the Islamic world. And to this another layer of problem. <coughs> According to the Islamic tradition, Umar ibn al-Khattab, the second caliph, declared that the land of Palestine between the Mediterranean Sea and the Jordan River is a waqf land. Means a holy endowment which was dedicated for holy usage for the, for the whole Islamic nation. This is what waqf means. So, waqf means stop. Stop of uh, buying and selling and giving to others, you cannot have any transactions on this land anymore. Since a land, or private land or whatever, somebody who can declare his land as waqf, ever since then, you, he cannot sell it, of course, according to the conditions which he made, but he can make it only at usage for the community, a school, a hospital, a cemetery, mosque, Whatever he decides, it's his uh, uh, authority to decide. But since he decides, this becomes a land or a piece of land which serves the community. This is waqf, waqf land. And there are some, several kinds of waqf. So the land of Israel, or what we call the land of Israel, what they call Palestine, entirely is a waqf land. So how could Jews as illegitimate they are as a religion and as a nation, 
and occupy this land and turn it into a different state which was detached from the Islamic soil. This is what land. How can you change the owner from Islamic ownership to something else which does not even the legitimacy to exist as a state or as a religion which anyway lost its validity. So this is another layer of illegitimacy which is on the religious one, the national one, and now the land one. All those layers of illegitimacy, Israel is built upon them in the Arab or Islamic way of thinking. Therefore, Israel is viewed as some kind of a satanic deed which is supposed to put the Muslims into a test. <coughs> what would you, my followers, as if Allah puts them in a test, or deal? How would you, Muslims, my believers, deal with this illegitimate entity, or as the Iranians uh, depict Israel since the Iranian revolution as a small state, state because it's the same. How would you relate to this? So when you when we come to talk about peace between the <coughs> Arab Islamic environment and the state of Israel. It's weird. How can we, Arabs and Muslims, make peace with something which was created by sin and uh, the whole existence of, this, of it is an evil? How can we agree to this? Add to this another thing. The concept of peace in the world is very clear. Peace is normal relations whatever normal relations are, the content, between sovereign, <coughs> independent states, let's say Germany and France. Everybody knows what the history was. Everybody remembers the 40s. When you look today on Germany and France, the same currency, the same more or less economy, <coughs> according to the rules of the uh, European Union. Uh, people are living in Germany, walking in France, cross the border every day, and vice versa. Couldn't be better. But Germany is an independent state, I would add still, and France is an independent state, again. Because, no, no, <laughs> the, the European uh, Constitution might turn Europe into something like the United States of America. So this is why I had the steel, because one day we might even see the, the borders dissolve if they are, exist uh, today. But they were. Yet, the peace between Germany and France is peace between <coughs> independent, sovereign states. This is peace in Western way of thinking. In Islam, peace is totally different thing. Peace is normal relations, normal life between communities, not states, communities, Jewish, Christian, Druze, Alawi, so forth, who live all under the umbrella of Islam. They don't have necessarily to be Muslims. They are not forced even to embrace Islam as a religion. Yet, they should all live under the Islamic rule and not acting against the Islamic State. This is peace in Islam. No, this is the only way of peace in Islam. Islam 
as principle cannot recognize the legitimacy of a state which is not ruled by Islam. This is the division between Dar al-Islam and Dar al-Haram. They can give peace, and we can see all over the world there are peace agreements between Islamic states and other states. Okay? This is always temporal peace, based on a precedent given by Muhammad in the year of 628, when he gave peace to the infidels of Mecca, which was peace for nine years, nine months, nine days. As we see here, everything is being sold for 9.99. This is the same thing. Nine years, nine months, nine days. This is what Islam can give to them. If a Muslim cannot win the war, he doesn't have to commit suicide. Okay? He can tell one peace. Whenever Allah gives him the power to violate this, the agreement, now there is a dispute whether he should or can violate the agreement. After all, Muhammad violated that agreement in the year of 630, only two years after he signed that peace for 999. Okay? So, and since he was infallible, since he was directed by Allah, since the light of Allah uh, enlightened his ways and his conduct, could he be wrong? by violating the agreement after two years? No, this is a precedent. Whenever you cannot win the war, you give them temporal peace. Whenever you cannot, means, uh, when, when, and when Allah gives you the power, you can violate the, 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 the agreement. How do we know that this precedent still works? President Sadat, in the year of 1977, started this initiative, his initiative, uh, of course, he went to the Azhar to ask for a fatwa, which will enable him uh, making peace with, with the Zionists. After all, Al Azhar gave a fatwa to Gamal Abdel Nasser, the one who was before him, that jihad should be waged on Israel. So now he went to the same uh, Dar Lifta, means the same house of uh, fatwa of uh, uh, Islamic verdicts. And he asked for permission. So they gave him a very long document which enables him to go forward with the peace with Israel, basing on the precedent of Muhammad in Hudaybiyah, the same temporal peace which Muhammad gave to the infidels of Mecca. Again, we saw the same idea of temporal peace of Hudaybiyah, the, the village where that peace was signed between Muhammad and Mecca. In the year of 1994, when Arafat was in South Africa, trying to collect maybe money or support to the new uh, Palestinian Authority, so one man challenged him, how could you possibly shake the hands of uh, Rabbi and sign a agreement with him? So we are just asking, what did the Prophet Muhammad did in Hudaybiyah? And in Israel we have the recording of this discourse. Mm -hmm. And he shut him up, the one who asked the question. Means everybody understood from this rhetorical question that it's actually, the Oslo agreements are actually a temporal agreement, which when we have the ability and the power and everything else, we will violate. Whether it was for domestic consumption or this is, these were his real intentions, I don't know. It's hard to detect now, Arafat. But uh, this is what he said. And this is documented and recorded. So, by the way, this is the way how uh, documents or events from the 7th century still are alive uh, these days. I'm not so sure that everything which was written when those nice people came down from the Mayflower road is still uh, the source of behavior in the American political arena. 
maybe, I don't know. But uh, what the Indian, Red Indians did in the 7th century, I'm almost sure that it doesn't play any role in the cont cont uh, contemporary uh, uh, political discourse in the United States of America. But in the Arab world, it works. Why not? Sources are still alive and kicking. For the precedents from the 7th century. Don't forget that the struggles over the caliphate in the mid of the 7th century between the 4th caliph, Ali ibn Abi Talib, and the 5th caliph, Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan, are still source for wars because this is the rift between the Shi and the Sunni Islam, which is still there for 13 and a half centuries. And they still didn't decide. Just imagine that the elections of 2004 between Bush and Al Gore, which was finished in the Supreme Court, would continue for 1,400 years. And Americans would fight each other and uh, shed each other's blood only for this question. Who backs George W. Bush and who is supporting uh, uh, Al Gore, okay? This is the Middle East. And I would even say, in general expression, which might serve you in other fields, problems in the Middle East are not solved, are only whitewashed. For a while, until they erupt again, then are again covered with a shallow cover only to be nice. Then they erupt again, and this is the Middle East. Problems are not, are not, are not uh, solved. This is not a place where states can have bloody war, as we saw in the 40s between Germany and France, and live peacefully with each other 60 years later, even much before. The Middle East is still a problem. These problems. Tribalism is still alive and kicking, and I would even say alive and killing in the Middle East. And this deserves another meeting. What is tribalism? What it means for the person? What it means for the family? What it means for the society? What it means for the state? What it means in politics? Because this is something which is total absolutely unknown and unfamiliar in Western societies. And this is a totally different, some different uh, dimension of problems which the Middle East has to live in. Islam on one side, tribalism on the other side, intermingle in many issues and make a, a whole salad of problems which very few even understand, let alone try to suggest any uh, solution. Just look at Iraq, which is a sign of problems between religions, between tribes, between sects, between all kinds of factions which can be. And uh, look, bringing democracy to such a, a region is not easy, as we already understand, because democracy is not elections. Elections in one day, in years, four or five years. Democracy is a daily conduct of society, of accepting the other as legitimate, first of all, accepting women's rights and minority rights and openness of the media and the right of assembly and, uh, right, and, and the freedom of thinking and freedom of expression, the freedom of publication. All these freedoms are creating allergy. In, middle, in too many Middle Eastern societies. And I'm not talking about those who finished Yale and Sorbonne and Oxford and even the American University in Cairo. I'm not talking about this shallow minority. I'm talking about the masses. Look, Egypt, a state of 80 million people, half of them live in un Unplanned neighborhoods. Unplanned neighborhoods means 
uh, neighborhoods which can have 200,000, 300,000 people with no running water, no sewage, no sewage, just imagine the diseases which run around there. No electricity, no communication, no social uh, infrastructure, no schools in many cases. And wherever, wherever there are schools, they work in three shifts. One starts at 7.30 in the morning, one 11.30 and one 3.30. Imagine starting to educate a kid for the second or third grade at 3.30 afternoon after he spent the whole morning and noon out there in the street. What benefit does it make? to start teaching in between 3.30 and 6.30 afternoon. Afternoon, in, in, in a hot place like Egypt, with no electricity, so you don't have air conditioning in the school, when it cannot even go to bathroom in the school, because there is no bathroom in the school, because there's no running water. Okay? This, uh, this is 40 million uh, uh, citizens of Egypt are living today in this. And in, the, in some cases, uh, they wake up in the morning, or they don't wake up in the morning, because uh, rocks just fell on them uh, because they live near a mountain which is not stable. And if you want, I can show you something like this, which is tossed just last uh, September. So, since the Middle East is such a salad of problems, uh, it is very hard to start to educate people to accept the other, especially those whom Islam views as illegitimate as a nation and whose state is illegitimate as a state because it was established on a land which should be Islamic land forever. Another component of the title is a suicidal anti-Semitism. Genocide. Suicide. How could a man commit a suicide? What good is it for? Okay, we live to live, we don't live to die. You know what, I didn't plan it, but I have here a document which an American friend wrote uh, two weeks ago. I would like to read you few uh, lines. This is a this is a letter which a friend from New York is a pseudonym was, it is, Edward Halevi wrote to a friend, real friend, uh, who is a Hamasnik in, uh, in, in Gaza. He wrote to him this letter. I would like to read you a few lines. You know, this was all totally unnecessary, the attack on Gaza. And that the decision to shell Israel guaranteed a fierce Israeli response, which guaranteed massive Palestinian death and destruction. I'm not going into, I just read what he wrote. And he is not a uh, uh, right wingish uh, Israel. Hamas could have simply continued the ceasefire and played the political card to possibly gain power in the West Bank. Uh, I'll jump paragraph, then it says, two months ago, there was a mass, uh, perhaps, you know what, you know Khaled Mash'al well, and you know he is no fool. He is an intelligent man who understands the likely consequences of his action. He know, he knew the likely uh, consequence consequences of shelling Israel after the expiration of the ceasefire on December 19th. Then why did he do it? Perhaps a big part of the, of the reason can be found 
in the comments of two people on the street. Comment, uh, comments reported over the past weeks and months in the New York Times. The first comment. Two months ago, there was a mass wedding sponsored by Hamas. Uh, it was in Gaza. An interviewer, I think it's an interviewer from the New York Times, asked one of the newly married young couples, the Yusufs, what their dream for the future was. The, the, the couple answered as one, quote, to die together in a suicide attack against Israel, end quote. New York Times, Mark, uh, October 31st, 2008. Second comment. Two weeks ago, there was a report from Shifa Hospital. This was within the uh, action on Gaza. Shifa Hospital in Gaza City, where a young wounded fighter, I believe Hamas fighter, demanded the doctors stop what they were doing and tend to him. The reporter shocked. Again, I believe it's the New York Times report because it's bought in the New York Times. The reporter, shocked at the young man's behavior, asked if he didn't see that the doctors were caring for women, for women and children far more seriously injured than he was. The young man answered that he was well aware, but that, quote, they should be happy to die as martyrs, end quote, and be on and he only wanted to get his wound stitched, stitched up so he could return to the fight because, quote, I want to die as a martyr too, end quote. New York Times, September 1st, 2009. These two comments. 2008. 2008. You're right. But it's, okay, I, I think it's time. Evidently, it's time. Uh, I think this, and this is from New York Times, not from any Israeli uh, propaganda tool, if there isn't, if there isn't. This was reported here. And this is the way of thinking there. People in the Middle East are walking around. In, in a feeling that the day of their death is written on their forehead. The date where they will pass to the other world is predetermined by Allah. The only way which is still open is the way how they will pass the border to the you could die from heart attack in his bed, he could be run over by a bus, or he could detonate himself within a bus or in a war against the Zionists. If he will, will die in bed with heart attack, he will be brought in front of the judgment in heaven, and if his sins are too many, he will go to hell, to the fire. Uh, the same will be if he will be run by a bus. But if he blows himself up in a bus, killing a good number of Jews or other infidels, or in a fight, he for sure be a martyr, a shaheed. Means go straight to heaven with no judgment. So since anyway he will die the same day, in a way, or another, so why waste my death on nothing, on a bus or a bed? Let us die in war, so we gain all the goodies of the paradise, which also deserve a whole meeting. What the Islamic paradise promises to the Shaheed? It's not only 72 virgins, it's the characteristics of those virgins, which are very important.
nights in the party. So, uh, death is not only the end of life in their views. Death is a goal <coughs> for itself, or the way to death is a goal for itself. It's not the end of life. It's something substantial which they are longing for and they are willing to get. Who understands this in a society where life, human life, is above everything, I would say, almost everything. This is why it's so hard to understand those shahids of those who run forward to die in whatever they believe. I would stop here, not because I finished my ideas, but I will open the floor for questions. Yes, sir. Yesterday, CNN interviewed a lady on Arab television who has trained 60 women suicide bombers because they are less conspicuous where they go. And this continues... No, it's not because they're less conspicuous. Because Israeli soldiers are not checking on women's bodies. I see. And they were, they were, they were, they have where to hide. Because if a, a, a man goes with an explosive belt, you, you can see the, the belt, you know? Right. But when a woman does it, it's less obvious, especially if she looks pregnant. Okay? Yeah. This, this is why they use women. And, of course, look, those women believe in what they do. That they are also doomed to die in the same day which they uh, die. But, let them... We, they want to choose the way. Can I ask a question? Yes, definitely. What's the, uh, in your estimation, how many people are actively willing to become uh, Shahids? And then what percentage of the Arab population do you think actually believes in the notion passively of uh, the merits of a Shahid? It's a very important question. But the answer is frightening. I'll tell you why. Imagine a fiery sermon you know what? Don't imagine. Israel, he had a woman, had a Kian on Hassel, Hail Kanuni, Hail Shari, while I must have been allowed to fear of dinner. You hear? Illegal? Just, just look. ولا مستقبل له في أرضنا ومصيره هذا كيان غاصب غير قانوني غير شرعي ولا مستقبل له في أرضنا ومصيره يعبر عنه دمنا والشعار الموت لإسرائيل Can you count how many people are here? Okay, let's say if one of thousand, only one out of thousand from those who are inflamed by Nasrallah in this speech, only by Nasrallah in Beirut in this speech, only if one of thousand is willing to go out and, and be a Shaheed, how many will be already here? Add to this in Egypt, in their sermons, and I can let you hear what it sounds in Egypt and in other places. Look, the Islamic nation today is a billion and three hundred million people. If one of thousand of those is willing to be a martyr, a martyr and fighter, you, you have million, one of thousand, it's million and three hundred thousand. How many uh, of our uh, precious boys, as Biladin said, uh, committed the September 11th, 20 less one, right? So you just imagine how many September 11ths can happen when you have one of thousand, no, let's say one of hundred thousand, only one of hundred thousand will volunteer to be this. You have already have 130,000 volunteers to be such a thing. So if 20, uh, brought about the September 11th, so just imagine how many September 11th can create it. 
by only one of 100,000 of these. So the, the numbers here make the difference. So, I have uh, two questions. Uh, one of them is, um, how do you see the, the dynamics when actually there is an Islamic community in the situation which is a minority, <coughs> let's say in Europe? In Israel. Let's say, no, no, I, I, I intentionally take it uh, away from the, from, from the Middle East. Okay? Ah, to Europe? Yes, let's say in Europe, let's say in the US even. Um, how do you see those concepts as, uh, you know, the, the concepts that are endemic to the homeland? Are they following in those communities? Uh, are they, in a way, getting diluted, uh, getting, uh, in a way, modernized? Uh, this is one, uh, one uh, part of my question. The second is that I am very, very much interested in what's going on in Turkey. Turkey is a kind of a test tube uh, for um, Islamic society. Of course, they are not Arabs, and they, are, they very much resent if someone is actually referring them as Arabs. Um, there is a situation that they have a history which, uh, in uh, let's say modern modern times, became a, a secular society, uh, following other to tools. extend. Yeah, of course. Following other took uh, yeah, way, and now um, it seems like there is a shift. I might be wrong. I'm not an expert on this. Uh, back into uh, Islamic uh, society, there, there is a there is a tension between, uh, let's say, two major groups in uh, Turkey. How do you see the future of the Turkey on on, on in that record? Okay, uh, two major questions. Uh, Muslims in, in Western uh, societies in exile. Uh, look, no doubt when Islamic group is in Western society, Western state, like in France or Australia or whatever, they are in friction with the environment. What happens is that uh, ideas from the environment infiltrate into this community, through the school, through the street, through the media, through the food which they eat, through wherever they go around, they sense the, 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 the environment. And things and changes are introduced, and I would say, rapidly, into this society. Look, a girl, 16-year-old girl, who goes to public school, whether in France <coughs> or in the States, or in Australia, Islamic girl, what, what would she wear, or what would she like to wear? Like what uh, her cousin who stayed in Algeria is wearing, the hijab, or she would like to wear what her uh, schoolmate uh, uh, wear. They, they would like, she would, a girl wants to look nice, okay? Wait a minute. So it, some of those girls start to go around with pants, with shirts, dye their uh, hair in, you know, in green and uh, purple somewhere, something like that. Just like, just like young girls wherever they are in the world. This creates severe worries in her father's heart, in her brother's heart, and tensions are introduced into the family, because, especially because of gender issues. She doesn't want to be ordered, she, doesn't, she wants to go and eat whatever she likes, in spite of the fact that it's not always halal, means kosher. She wants to go to movies, she wants to wear this, she doesn't want to wear that, and all of a sudden this family is in struggle with, in, with, within. And this creates much resentment, not only against the door, but against the environment which corrupted the door. And this uh, in spite of the fact that they look at the, the, the Pakistani minority in Britain, those who performed the attacks in July 7, 2005, in London, were English born Pakistani, Bo were born in England. They learned in school just like the others. Okay? So it, the fact that you were born in a place and you were educated in a school 
in a place, and public school in the same place, it doesn't necessarily mean that you became part of the way of thinking of the place. So my Islamic minorities in these places, in spite of the fact that they look like the others, or they work in, you know, in the place, it doesn't mean necessarily that they are all there. In many cases, the contrary, they develop resentment against the environment, and we see it very nicely in Australia. You know, in, in near Sydney, there are some towns which are populated by Muslims. Liverpool, La Kemba, and I forgot the name of the third one. These are Arab enclaves. And I, when I was there, I was listening to Friday's sermon uh, in the radio, in the Islamic radio. Much more interesting than listening to, to the Australian uh, radio, for me at least. And uh, I heard things which my hair almost uh, fell from my head. They are uh, warning everybody from going to the beach, because beach, you know, hell's bell. Uh, women are not uh, always totally uh, 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 dressed, and they should keep their daughters from going to the Bondi beach, I think. They, they, uh, there was, some, there was some, some fight over this beach because of some girls. Yes, and they feel very much vulnerable because of the friction with the environment. So the fact that they emigrated to the West does not mean that they became Western. In some cases, they become even more radical in order to preserve their own culture, their own religion, their own morals and values. So, Professor, uh, you, you have outlined for us uh, the religious reasons in the Quran where Jews are a religion and reasons that they don't deserve and should not have a separate land. And it's fairly deep-seated. In other words, they, they pre, as a pre-existing religion, they should be ostracized and therefore no, uh, no nationality, no land should be recognized. Now, we are most, we're very concerned with that and we appreciate learning about it. But in terms of looking for the peaceful solution, this difference that's embedded in the Quran and embedded in these principles that you're explaining to us today seem almost insurmountable if it's so deeply felt in their religion that we can even build some kind of peace on that. So how do you, uh, how do you go beyond explaining to us what the Islamic genocide hatred is and how do we try to overcome that? It seems like uh, it's such a deep felt principle coming from Muhammad and the Quran that uh, uh, the entire existence of Israel doesn't desire the recognition that we're looking for. Well, if I may sum your question is, what is the solution, you say? You ask well, yeah, is, there, is there a solution? Is there a solution? Is there if, if there is, um, changing, I'll, 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 tell, I'll, I'll tell you in my view. Please, that was, that's what my question is. Uh, look, we tried everything else. We tried agreements, we had the Oslo agreements, we tried we tried, since that failed, we tried unilateral um, steps by withdrawal, by detaching ourselves from Gaza, for example. Mm -hmm. we, we got totally the opposite. So I think that, as I, as I said, the problems in the Middle East are not solved, are only whitewashed over. No more. For a while. And you know what? If you look at the Zionist history, ever since Petah Tikva was established, the first uh, Jewish uh, modern settlement in 1882, which is 100 and uh, almost uh, 20 something years, okay? Ever since then, I would state Israel, before 48, after 48, is in a constant war which has its ups and downs. It had, it had its ups in 20, 21, 29, 36, 48, 40, uh, 56, 67, 73, 82. We had, you know, it's like ups and downs. This is the, I would even say the fate of Israel, to live in such a situation. We have to know how to manage it. Solving it is a problem. Now, once I, once in a while I have, meetings with a, a, an Egyptian diplomat from the 
Egyptian uh, embassy in Israel. We meet in a restaurant, you know, in the open air, we don't hide it. He even sends me what he writes afterwards, so I can add. You know. So I just think, look, there is peace between Israel and Egypt, but there is no normalization. Because there are some 50 agreements on every possible field, agriculture, academic life, culture, uh, commerce, you name it. There, is a, there are dozens of agreements between Israel and Egypt. Most of them are not implemented on the ground because of this, this, that, and that. Not implemented. So I ask him, when there will be already peace, normalization between Israel and Egypt? He looks at me and he says, you cannot expect to have normalization with Arabs before Arabs have normalization between themselves. You as Jews, as Israelis, cannot expect to receive from the Arabs what they don't give to each other. Now, what do I mean? You know that the European Union started as at the first, one of the first steps was the, the common European market. This was the start of the, the 50s and 60s. This was the beginning of the, the lower layer of what we should see today, the, the uh, European Union. The European market. They decided and they did to buy from each other in order to enhance the industry in Europe. Why buying from the Japs? Why, the, why, why, why buying from the Americans? Let's buy from each other and this will develop us. Clever idea? Very nice idea. The Arab League decided already in the 50s to create the common Arab market. Is there any? Is there any? No. no. They decided it like two weeks ago in the Kuwait summit. They decided again to establish the common Arab market. How can you explain it? For 50 years they are trying to create such a simple thing. It, instead of buying from the Koreans, buy from the Syrians. They will not buy from each other. They will buy from others. Why? Tribalism. Why? I will punish him because he did, was not nice to me and that. And, you know, accounts. I won't get into this, but this is this. So far they failed even to establish the first cornerstone of the uh, 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 common up uh, market. So how can Israel expect to get from Arabs normalization when they don't even buy from each other because of all kinds of accounts? I'm, I'm so gonna, this is actually... We have three minutes left and we have to leave the room because we have another one coming in. But can you go back to Alon's question about Turkey? And I'll just ah, say, Turkey, I forgot. I'll just say that uh, oh, yeah. two, two nights ago I had the privilege of being with uh, Bernard and his friend Eva. And he yes. was in Israel. Uh -huh. He was speaking about uh, Turkey saying that the Islamists have infiltrated not only the state, but a large part of the bureaucracy, um, the economy, and the only hope for that is the military. So, Look, uh, Turkey, just to be schematically talking, has, is a state with two heads. Unlike every other state where the military is subject to decisions made by the government, other, otherwise it's a coup d'etat. Okay? Always the army is a, a faithful servant of the civil uh, 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 elected or freely elected government or parliament or whatever they are. Military, uh, uh, an army which acts according to its own agenda is a military dictatorship. Okay? In Turkey, according to the constitution, the army is sovereign. The army is free. The army can do whatever he likes, even to come out from the camps and to send the politicians home. And this already happened a few times. So uh, the secular, I would say, circles have their stronghold, the army. And the Islamists have their strongholds in the parliament, in the government, and in the presidency. So, I would say a two-headed state. Uh, I hope it answers your question. And there is infiltration from side to side, but, but this, uh, to simplify, 
Uh, the picture, I would say this, but it's much more complicated. Much more complicated. Don't forget, every, every society, many societies, when there is a move to one side, there is another move to the other side, to the opposite side, because people are too worried that we are approaching that side. And this is a whole uh, uh, theory in sociology, but this actually, you can see in many places that strengthening of one uh, 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 trend in society creates the opposite uh, 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 trend as well, as a result. Because people are worried that we are going too far and too fast to that side. So this is how society, in many cases, and in many places, and in, in Turkey yeah. this way. So I'm sorry we have to cut the conversation now because there are many more questions. But <laughs> we have to use it. Thank you very much.